Okay, well, uh, good evening uh, or good morning or whatever time it is for you. Um, <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, Gothic Histories and Historical Gothic, Medieval to Modern Wales and Welsh Gothic Fiction. You might know me as CM Rosens on Twitter, um, but my actual name <laughs> is uh, Dr. Melissa Julian Jones. Um, I'm from Cardiff University. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, I, uh, sort of an overview of Welsh history from the sort of pre-Roman Roman times up through to the 20th century. And I'm going to be looking at how historical themes and events shaped and appear in Welsh Gothic fiction. Um, I'm going to do a section on Welsh folklore. We'll see what time we've got, uh, whether I've got time between the sections um, for uh, questions or a pause. If not, if you don't mind, uh, we'll go straight through and I'll have questions at the end, which is what happened this morning. Um, so there we go. So first of all, Welsh history, uh, Welsh Gothic in context, a lovely view of the uh, Sugarloaf Mountain there across to Aberfernie. Um, content warnings, this chapter, it's historical. So you've got some uh, infant death, uh, gruesome death, grief, loss, uh, tragedy and lament. Um, there is, uh, in some of the Gothic novels, uh, suicide and sexual threat as plot points, which will be mentioned and referenced, but not discussed in detail. I do have a slide about paramilitary groups, um, so there is a picture of uh, a march with uniforms and flags, just in case anyone needs a heads up for that, and that will be in the uh, sort of towards the end of the 20th century section. Um, I'm going to take you through some poetry and prose as well. Um, so uh, as examples, um, but I'm going to start off just to give you a little bit of context. So we're going to have a look at Wales in the Roman era or um, early Middle Ages. Um, first of all, in terms of terminology, the Welsh, um, are, if you hear sort of terms like the Britons, um, they are interchangeable. So the island is called Britain, obviously. Um, the Britons with an O are the, uh, considered themselves to be the indigenous group um, and were high kings or overlords of all Britain. So you have in the Mabinogi, sort of the, the High King of Britain is uh, Bran the Blessed, Bendigade Fran, um, who is a giant and is the overlord of, or the High King of Britain. Um, and uh, you have, so they're Brythonic speakers, which is a uh, form of Old Welsh. Uh, Brythonic speakers um, appear as far north as Edinburgh and Cumbria, which is, uh, you know, a place in Debrae from Cymru, which is what, um, Welsh call themselves. Welsh is a Saxon word imposed on the uh, this people group for um, meaning foreigner, um, but is adopted and reclaimed in the medieval period. So by something like the 12th, 13th century, um, Welsh is being used in Wales. Um, they are Christianized gradually, uh, become very passionate about their own saints and spiritual lineage, claim direct apostolic descent from John the beloved apostle, um, who is the disciple that Jesus loved. Um, so you have this uh, tradition, which is distinct from uh, sort of Western Romanized tradition and also distinct from the Eastern uh, Orthodox kind of tradition, um, which crops up in Ireland and Wales and um, is different to the Romanized Saxon uh, version of Christianity as well, interestingly. Um, you have, um, you do have druids, uh, I will mention the druids because druids pop up in Welsh Gothic fiction Anach anachronistically, um, the Romans talk about killing all the druids on Anglesey, um, which is up here, that's Anglesey there, um, off the coast of North Wales, um, so, and uh, the druids tend to be demonised in Roman source material, that's not actually the case when you look at how um, uh, druids are depicted in Welsh Gothic fiction necessarily, um, so we'll come on to that a bit later on. I'm not going to dwell on um, druids and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, Ron Hutton's written a really good book on that, um, and Darrow's here as well, so I'm sure he can <laughs> knows more than me. Um, but just for some context, so moving forwards in time, um, Welsh poetry developed some of the most complex forms in Europe, with multiple genres and styles. 
Um, one of the main genres or most uh, very popular kind of genre is the praise poetry, uh, which is very well known. Um, but another really big genre is the lament or the eulogy commemorating defeat in battle and mourning the deaths of the fallen. Poetry in bardic tradition is incredibly important, um, particularly in the medieval period, um, because bards are charged with the uh, collective memory of the people. Um, genealogy is incredibly important to the Welsh. Um, you, you know, you can trace your lineage back as far as Adam and Eve, um, and you do so uh, having memorised it um, and going through sort of all of your patrilineal, matrilineal lines, uh, you, you can do it matrilineally. Um, you have uh, this tradition of um, very complex uh, oral compositions of poetry. Um, we have a number were written down in the Middle Ages, so from the 13th century onwards, we have collections of um, books. I'll get onto the four ancient texts of Wales and that kind of thing, and briefly in a moment. Um, I'm using Tony Conran's translation. I'm not commenting on like th the accuracy of the translation. I think it's just a very accessible one, um, which I'm using to pick up the the idea. So just so you get an idea. Um, so the segment on the on your screen is part of an anonymous 9th century saga poem, which is fragmented about the sacking of Cundalan's Hall Penguin, which is uh, modern day Shrewsbury, which is in modern day England. Um, and the following extract is uh, from part of the saga and it's um, Heleth's section. So she's the sister of Cundalan and her lament picks up after the uh, English or the Saxons um, sack and destroy um, Shrewsbury Penguin. So you get an idea of it. So dark is Candelan's hall tonight with no fire, no bed. I weep a while, then I'm silent. Dark is Candelan's hall tonight with no fire, no candle, save for God who will keep me sane. So the alley is the, the river and there they, they are river eagles. And so she sees the, the river eagles and she says, uh, Eagle of LA allowed its cry tonight, had drunk of a pool of blood, the heart's blood of Candelan Wynn, um, which is her brother. Um, and you have this uh, sort of, you have this kind of tradition of um, walking through ruins and this kind of uh, the lament and the aftermath and the, the processing of grief um, in long poetic style. Um, and that's um, something that crops up in uh, sort of old Welsh poetry. Um, and it's so so you have these sorts of themes and these sorts of things were um, rediscovered. Um, I won't say rediscovered, but um, were kind of um, made more popular during the cultural renaissance in Wales, which was sort of the late 18th century and into the 19th century. Um, so people became more aware of the contents of these books. Um, the four ancient books of Wales, um, which are digitized mainly by the National Library of Wales, um, are the Black Book of Carmarthen, the Red Book of Hergest, the Book of Taliesin, and the Book of Aneirin. Uh, the Book of Aneirin is pictured on your screen here, um, or a, fac a facsimile page. Um, these books are written in Middle Welsh in the 13th to 15th centuries. They're compilations of poetry and prose, recording things which are much older than um, the actual text, the date of the actual creation of the texts themselves. Um, the term, the four ancient books, was coined by a uh, Scotsman, William Forbes Skeen. I forgive me if that's the wrong pronunciation of his surname. Um, 1809 to 1892 um, is, are his dates. And he um, edited and translated these four books that had been in antiquarian hands um, for centuries, basically. Uh, there are numerous translation errors in his uh, 1868 edition, um, but, you know, he gave it a go. Um, and these are the kinds of texts that are then popularised and sort of in, uh, encourage people to look at the Welsh source material um, in greater detail. So you have the books, uh, the, the Black Book of Carmarthen, uh, the Black Book and the Red Book are so-called because of the colouring of their binding, which is obviously not original. 
Um, Taliesin is a prophet bard um, who can speak to animals, um, and there is his story of how that happened um, as part of sort of the Welsh myth, uh, you know, um, so, and you also have him talking to um, figures like Merlin or Merivin, um, as, uh, as in the Arthurian made famous Merivin, um, but he is uh, a figure in his own right, he is a bard prophet, um, and he has a conversation with Taliesin that's in poetic style. Um, and they prophesy uh, the defeats of the Welsh and victories of the Welsh in battle by the Normans. Um, to the point that um, in the when Henry I invaded, um, there's particular prophecies about um, Wales and Ireland that uh, are attributed to Merlin. And he deliberately found some stones that um, Merlin had prophesied about. Um, and did the thing the prophecy said would never happen and then said who now will believe the liar Merlin um, as a deliberate undermining of uh, the these sorts of prophecies um, so these are so prophecies are um, particularly important um, and you'll see that cropping up in the Welsh Gothic fiction of the when this is kind of um, made a theme later on so bear that in mind. So moving forwards a little bit, um, we're still in the early Middle Ages, um, and you have uh, someone called King Cadwallader, um, who is seventh century, so in the six hundreds. Um, he is mythologized by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who is uh, a monk and uh, historian, in a loose term. Um, who wrote um, several books of, uh, and histories. In the medieval period, history writing is not um, the same thing as writing about facts. History writing is a form of entertainment. It is also um, a way of demonstrating to people how today came about. And so the stories that you record may have a lot of poetic license or artistic license in the way that you record them. Um, they generally are moralizing and they generally um, have some, uh, you know, you, there is a purpose or a, a kind of a reason or a framing around them. So it's not particularly intended to be the same thing as history writing today, okay? So Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote um, uh, about Cadwallader, um, and Cadwallader was claimed to be the last high king of all Britain. Um, there are prophecies about the lineage of Cadwallader and later on um, the Stuarts and particularly sort of Charles II and the restoration of the monarchy um, was, uh, Charles II was supported by the Welsh because they saw him as the last legitimate descendant of Cadwallader. So, uh, and that's in the 1660s. So it's, it's a very sort of, <laughs> it's a long lived thing. Um, so Cadwallader is defeated by the Saxons, the territory of the Britons uh, shrinks dramatically. This is a sort of the Geoffrey of Monmouth kind of um, telling of it. Um, and eventually the Britons or the Welsh uh, settle in Wales and you have uh, a series of kingdoms of general ruler, uh, uh, rulers who take over general, um, general, why do I keep saying that word? Uh, smaller kingdoms um, and Wales is broken down into multiple kingdoms. Um, Howell Var, who dies around uh, 950, is one of the very few rulers who is high king of nearly all Wales, nearly all Wales, not all Wales. Um, and the law of Howell Var is a famous legal text, the Cyffraith Howell, um, which claims to have been set down by Howell Var himself um, but the first manuscript of it, um, which is written in Welsh, um, uh, it, there are uh, there are sort of Latin texts prior to that, I think, um, it dates from around the 14th century, and it's named after him, so that's a kind of codified uh, Welsh law manuscript, um, and it's called the Law of Howelvar. So, um, Wales was governed by rulers who parceled out lands equally among their acknowledged sons, both legitimate and illegitimate, um, because they were very, uh, so, so polyamory, concubinage, that was uh, a very common thing in Wales. Um, polygyny was a common practice of the legal wife and acknowledged mistresses or concubines. 
Um, they weren't too bothered, uh, according to Gerald of Wales, who is very critical about this, uh, weren't too bothered about um, homosexual relationships or not bothered enough. Um, and um, they, what they used to do was if you had a number of sons, it didn't matter who their mothers were uh, or who their mothers were in relation to you, if you acknowledged that they were yours, um, that gave them equal legal rights with all of your other children. Um, so uh, this was fine in theory. Um, however, if you think about it in practice, um, it basically means that if you have a large kingdom when you die, but you have seven acknowledged sons, um, each of those sons gets an equal share of that kingdom. So it's divided into seven. So the onus is on conquering more lands from your neighbours to give to your kids. But also, if you're one of those seven kids and you really want a decent share of the land, it's probably best if one of your brothers uh, cuts their throat while shaving um, or, you know, has a nasty accident on a horse that makes their head fall off. Um, and that sort of thing does happen occasionally. Um, so you also have a foster system, which makes the politics even more complex, because the other thing you do in order to gain allies is you foster out your kids. So basically it's a big kid swap. And you give your child to somebody to raise with them and they give you uh, one of theirs to raise with your children and so on. So you have this network of alliances, which is fantastic while you're alive. But when you die and then you have a number of children who can inherit from you and they all have their own foster families who now have a stake in that child's success and in that child's power and wealth, um, you then have a network of people who will come in on different sides of the, the inevitable war um, that's going to happen uh, to try and get um, a bigger share. So you have a, a lot of um, turbulence within Wales, and this is one of the reasons why when the Normans come in, um, they don't really come in until about 1090s. So they're, they're too busy kind of consolidating their uh, takeover of England sort of post 1066. There is a, a short lived conquest of a part of South Wales in 1083, uh, 1086 to seven, but um, that's one guy um, It doesn't start kind of, uh, you know, kicking off until about the 1090s. Um, and it's quite easy because all you have to do is come in and take over one kingdom at a time. And uh, originally they're invited in by um, a, exactly this sort of a, a warring neighbors, warring uh, lo uh, native rulers who think that, well, next door's changed hands, but that's okay. Um, so we'll just do what we've always done. Um, the treaties are more or less the same. Um, we'll just, like we did with the sort of the Anglo-Saxon um, chieftains, we'll invite them over um, to help us out in this struggle. Um, that, that, you know, we'll give them something for it um, and that will be fine. And except it wasn't fine because the Normans went, yes, we will help you in your, uh, your struggles with each other, but we don't want to leave. And you also can't make us leave. And so you have Norman lords taking over Welsh kingdoms and inserting themselves into that space. Um, they keep the laws the same, more or less. Um, they then bring in settlers um, and kind of you end up with Englishries and Welshries later on with the Welsh in the uplands under Welsh law and the English settlers that have been brought in in the Englishry, which is in the more fertile kind of space in the, the you know, the valley floor, for example. And you have this kind of two tier system. Um, but you also have them intermarrying with Welsh rulers and with um, uh, sort of the daughters of Welsh rulers. Um, and you have these kind of and Welsh rulers themselves then intermarry with the powerful daughters and, uh, you know, of um, the Anglo-Norman lords themselves. You have a lot of um, it's a very permeable border and you have a lot of things going on. Um, but it does mean that Wales ends up um, greatly um, divided. So you have Curawalia, um, which is the land ruled by the native rulers of Wales, um, which is kind of Snowdonia, Powys, and then sort of the Midlands of Wales here, so the Hoibar and that kind of thing. And the March, um, which are the areas of Wales under Anglo-Norman control or Flemish control in some cases, 
Um, we normally think of the march as being just this bit along the border. Um, it's also at this time around here in North Wales. There are some uh, March of Lordships up, up north. Um, and all the way down here, most of the south um, into the Gower, all the way across, and Pembrokeshire, which is here, the bit that looks like a horse. Um, this section is heavily settled. Um, so you have um, a lot going on. Um, and Wales is very much split and it they basically just literally take over one bit at a time until they walk themselves across over here. Um, you also have issues with the expansionist policies of the pure Walia uh, rulers, like uh, the rulers of Gwynedd, um, causing hostility with other Welsh rulers. So this continues. It's not they're never really united. Um, and you also have spirings of women connected by marriage and birth. Um, passing information between their Welsh fathers and their Norman husbands and each other and all sorts of things. Um, so it's uh, it's a very exciting time to be alive. Um, and this is unsurprisingly the setting for a lot of Gothic novels um, of the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, because it's a more interesting time to be alive, I suppose, um, for a given value of interesting. Um, so for example, you've got um, Tales like um, the witcheries of Craig Isaf in 1805 that come out um, by William Frederick Williams. Um, it's a Gothic history set in the Welsh marches during the reign of William Rufus. Uh, William Rufus, uh, if for those of you who want to keep the timeline straight, is the son of William the Conqueror. So um, this novel um, divides twin sisters. Um, there's uh, one who, the oldest one who goes with their strict hierarchy obsessed aunt and is very kind of normanized and then there is the dispossessed youngest twin sister alice and she um, aligns herself uh, because a great injustice is brought upon her in terms of she's sort of um, she's robbed of her inheritance and um, she aligns herself with the anarchic sorceress of Craigisaf. Um, Alice then summons through witchcraft um, a knight to defend her and to win back um, her lands and so forth. And she is herself revealed to be that knight in the big reveal at the end. So she's kind of turned herself into a knight through witchcraft. Um, and um, she attempts to avenge herself against her father. Um, she is ultimately defeated and throws herself off the castle battlements because um, at this point in history the victory is inevitably given to the Normans because you're setting it at a point in history where the Normans have already won. Um, so that's it's so it's very much a tragedy um, and the narrator's sympathies lie with Alice the rebellious twin even though Alice is ultimately defeated at the end so you can kind of make of that um, story kind of what lots of different layers of things going on there. Um, you also have um, Curtis's um, Ethelwina, which is 1799. Um, I'm not sure I would class this as Welsh Gothic, but it is set in Wales. Um, so I've added it here. Um, and it's the Welsh setting that's interesting because um, the impenetrable castle in the mountains of Wales um, is an important setting because in the Middle Ages, when this is purported to be set, um, the King's writ doesn't run in the march. So that means you can get away with doing whatever you want, basically, because all the King can do is say, please don't do that. And you can say, make me. And he can say, well, um, please don't do that. And that's about all he can do. Uh, and unless you have a significant lands in England that he can use against you as leverage, um, you can't really do very much. So um, as an example, um, if those of you who know who William Cantaloupe is, who was murdered in 1375, that I've done a, a course on. So one of his ancestors, well, um, so not direct ancestor, but um, William III, um, who is uh, alive in the 1240s, um, they're all called William. So um, it, he marries Eva de Breos, who is, uh, a marcher heiress um, and also an heiress to the old and Pembrokeshire part part co heiress of that. And this is the first time that the cantaloupes have actually had uh, this branch of the cantaloupes have actually held significant lands in the march. So he's really excited. He goes in 
uh, gets hold of his wife's lands. This is excellent. And um, John of Monmouth, uh, who is a neighbor of his, dies. And William, for some reason, thinks that John, the Mon John of Monmouth's castle, which is uh, not even particularly, I don't think it's even a stone castle. I think we're talking about some sort of Motton Bailey construction you can hold with three men and a dog. And it's on a hill and he thinks it's his. And he thinks that this section of, of land is his, so he takes it. Meanwhile, um, John of Monmouth's son, who is also called, you guessed it, John of Monmouth, uh, the younger, uh, wants his lands back. Um, so there's a there's this customary inquest. The king takes all of the uh, lands into his hands for the inventory of, of you know, and then he he passes it back. That's how it works. Um, and it's recorded that. John the Younger gets all of his lands uh, except for this one castle um, in South Wales, which he can't have because William Cantaloupe has it. So this is in 1240, I want to say 1246, seven. Anyway, um, and Henry goes, well, can you give him the castle back because it's not yours? And William says, no. And uh, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, William Cantaloupe's father is the king's steward. His grandfather was the king's steward. The Cantaloupes have lands all across England. They don't do this in England because they can't. Um, but in the March, William can do basically whatever he wants. And um, William point blank refuses to give this little castle back to the point that there are several letters that are open letters that are sent out from the king um, over a period of about three years. It gets to the point where he, the king charges the sheriff of Hereford to raise the men of Hereford against William and against this castle. Um, it doesn't appear that that actually happened in practice. And what happens is in 1252, so bearing in mind this started back in, you know, 1240, whatever, so it's gone on long enough. Uh, <laughs> um, in 1252, William's father dies with all of his lands in England up for grabs. And William expects to inherit. And the king goes, right, finally. And he takes all of those lands. And he goes, right, if you want your lands back, give that castle back. So that's how William gives the castle back and then it burns down. So, I mean, it, I mean, was it worth it? Probably not, but it's the principle that matters. Um, and the fact that the king could not do anything about it, just couldn't do anything about it um, for years. Um, so when, when you sort of see these ideas of um, the Welsh castle as a setting um, and it's a march a lord kind of setting, um, that's kind of where the there is nobody coming to help you kind of idea <laughs> comes from uh, because they literally can't uh, there's no there's no kind of recourse to royal intervention or anything it's just whatever he wants to do to you the lord can do um so that's a that's an interesting point um then we have two figures who are national heroes in Wales uh, moving through to the later middle ages in this uh, context you have Llewellyn ap Griffith who's um, 1223 to 1282 so he's the son of uh, Griffith ap Llewellyn who is the son of Llewellyn ap Llorwerth <laughs> um that's so he's I think what are we on Edward the first second cousin Llewellyn ap Griffith I think that's how it works um, he's the last independent ruler of Wales, of Gwynedd. Um, he's married to uh, a very um, powerful and prominent, he's, uh, the de Montforts are a very powerful and prominent uh, marcher family, um, also a, a you know, Anglo-Norman family. Um, they're earls, I think, as well. So, you know, um, and he is, he is at war with Edward I. Um, and it results in him being killed in a duel at Kilmeri uh, on December the 11th, 1282. And this is by accident. Um, so he's traveling incognito because he's at war and he uh, is, the story goes that he is, or one of the stories goes that he is um, accosted by uh, uh, sort of a, a Norman knight, or not Norman at this, at this point, but um, 
a, a knight on the road who is one of Edward's knights who doesn't recognize him and they have an exchange of words which leads to a duel because Llewellyn thinks he can take him and he can't take him and he's killed and that's the point at which the knight realizes he's slain the he's not, not only you know Llewellyn but the king's cousin so that's um, but also he's uh, inadvertently ended the war. <laughs> um, so Edward I then consolidates his conquest of Wales uh, in pretty short order. He brings Wales under his control by 1284 um, and names his son and heir Prince of Wales, which is a title that's been held by all heirs to the English throne ever since. And Llewellyn ap Griffith himself is mythologized as a figure uh, for Welsh independence. Uh, he's so he's buried at Cumhir, the Abbey of Cumhir, um, and he is decapitated. And um, the head is then displayed at Cheapside in London, um, you know, sort of on Traitor's Gate or on spikes and that kind of thing um, as evidence that he is dead. Um, so that comes up um, in as a theme of Gothic um, poetry and prose. There's sort of references to uh, Llewellyn Ap Griffith. Um, who appears uh, in modern fiction. Uh, there's an example of a girl who is encouraged to, um, act, uh, to, to commit acts of domestic terrorism in defense of the Welsh language um, by Llewellyn Ap Griffith, who appears to her in a dream. Um, and that's uh, sort of, that was a book that came out in the 1980s, I think. And um, you also have um, uh, sort of curses being uh, dropped on Welsh gentry um, because they betrayed Llewellyn Ap Griffith or Owen Glyndor, depending on, um, uh, you know, uh, which figure you're going for. Um, so those sorts of themes crop up. Um, Owen Glyndor himself um, is a later figure. He's an interesting man, um, technically a march lord at that point, um, because there's no native rulers anymore. Um, and he becomes a figure of uh, a sort of a representative of Welsh independence. You'll still see um, people flying the flag of Glyndor um, today um, if, if in, uh, you know, if they support independent Wales and that kind of thing. Uh, his rebellion began just because he had a dispute with his neighbour who, uh, so the, the king was going into, the king at the time was going to battle with Scotland again and summoned everybody to go to Scotland with him. And the neighbor intercepted uh, the summons so that Owain didn't go. The neighbor then said to the king that Owain had not gone because he was being deliberately uh, rebellious. And he, it was, you know, when this wasn't the case, he just didn't get the letter. And um, the king then treated Owain very harshly and Owen, Owain then responded um, by rebelling, um, actually rebelling. He uh, tried to establish uh, an independent Welsh uh, sort of uh, government. Um, obviously, he was going to be the leader of that. Um, he put down, it was the, the, his uh, um, campaigns for Welsh independence were uh, military campaigns with the front with uh, allied with the French who didn't show up to a particular battle. Um, so um, that was defeated. Uh, he was put down decisively and he became mythologized as an Arthur figure um, that he just disappeared. You know, he didn't die. He kind of went into the hills and he will return at some point. So the return of Glyndwr is um, a point of uh, a, myth a mythologized um, thing. Um, so Gothic Alert, um, those two uh, characters kind of crop up um, as themes or as references um, or are directly invoked in some uh, of the sort of Welsh Gothic fiction, particularly dealing with injustice and betrayal. Um, you've got an example of uh, The Welshman, a Romance in 1801 by William Earle, um, which is set at the time of the 13th century conquest of Wales, delineating Edward I's atrocities. Um, which leave behind a devastated countryside, manic widows on hopeless quests for their lost husbands, dispossessed rebels plotting revenge in caves, all of that joy. Uh, it doesn't end well for the protagonist, whose name is Madoc. Um, he believes he is um, being assailed by uh, demons or spirits and, and wants to be exorcised. The, this anachronistic druid randomly pops up um, as a kind of spiritual... Um, 
element to it, uh, which is interesting. Um, and uh, that doesn't work, his exorcism doesn't work. He succumbs to the fear of excommunication. So in the novel, Edward I has influenced the Pope to excommunicate all Welshmen who resist his rule. That isn't really what happened, but never mind. Um, and so Madoc then attempts suicide. He bungles it. Um, he throws himself off a cliff onto some very pointy rocks and dies after two days of agony, impaled on one of them while the surrounding hollows echo with his groans. Um, so it's very fatalistic, very tragic. Um, and that's very much a kind of, those are the vibes, if you like, um, of, of Welsh Gothic fiction, this fatalistic, inevitable tragedy, um, but also um, kind of mapping on um, the 18th, 19th century context and political arguments of the time and that kind of thing onto the fiction as, as is their want. So we move forward then, uh, rapid pace into the Tudors, um, skipping over the Wars of the Roses. We don't have time. <laughs> the Tudor family are an established elite family at this point. Uh, they have lands in both England and Wales. Their seat in Wales is called Penmanid. Edmund Tudor is the son of Owen Tudor uh, and Catherine de Valois. And because he's the son of Catherine de Valois, he's the half brother of, the, of King Henry VI of England. So he's got a claim to the throne. His son, Henry, has a claim to the throne. Um, and he, Henry is, uh, of course, Henry Tudor, Henry VII, who establishes the Tudor dynasty um, following you know, the Battle of Bosworth Field and my horse, my horse, kingdom for horse, all that. Anyway, so Henry VIII, pictured there, um, takes further control of Wales um, during his reign via the Laws in Wales Acts of 1536 to 1542. So 36 is the first act of union, um, and that's the one that makes Wales officially, administratively and legally a part of England. So it is no longer its own country, it is now an English state. Um, as part of this, all MPs, all members of parliament had to speak English, um, and this act was only repealed in 1993 um, by the Welsh Language Act, which now means that members of parliament can speak in Welsh with a translator. Um, so this was um, a big move by Henry VIII to centralise power. And um, you have the Council of the Marches at this point, which is has a president um, to kind of preside over Welsh affairs. Um, but it is basically now just part of England and um, Welsh law is eliminated before you could um, you could still use Welsh law. Um, but now it's a central kind of um, there is no there is no such thing anymore. I mean, Edward I had started to kind of phase that out and so forth. Um, but yeah, so now it's uh, everything is the same. Um, except, of course, for the actual culture in Wales, which is markedly different to England. Um, witchcraft is outlawed by the 1563 Witchcraft Statute. Um, thank you, James. Uh, but despite there being no shortage of candidates for witch trials in Wales, uh, practically every village has a cunning woman or its village witch. Um, in 1588, Cardiff bailiffs received a reprimand for not bringing witches before the bar. The reprimand uh, had limited effect. From 1550 to 1720, only 42 people were indicted for witchcraft in Wales, and the penalty could just be a fine and a stint in prison. Only five people were actually hanged. By contrast, in England and Lowland Scotland during the same pe uh, period, 2,000 people um, were executed. So in England, they're hanged. In Lowland Scotland, they are burned um, for witchcraft, the majority of whom are women. Uh, as far as Wales goes, uh, we have 20 cases in from the Court of the Great Sessions that survive uh, in their fullest form. We have fragments of others, um, and those show that most of those are acquitted. Others are imprisoned for a time and then released uh, or just fined. Only five are executed by hanging, same as in England, and these are four women and one man, and the man is uh, the brother of two of the women. 
Um, so Gothic alert, because the figure of the witch is a very prominent one in Welsh Gothic fiction, um, but is also a very ambiguous figure. Um, so these are the real life um, kind of, these are the, these are the five basically that, that we know of who were hanged. So you at 1594, a healer Gwen Vergelis from Betus was persuaded by her friend Jane Conway to curse Jane's sworn enemy, Sir Thomas Mostyn. Um, so if you're spotting the class uh, differentiation, well done. That's actually important. Um, Gwen is accused by the Bishop of St. Asaph's, William Hughes, um, of being a witch. And following his accusation, seven others come forward with other claims, including hastening the death of a sick man by witchcraft, which seals her fate. And she was hanged in Denby of that year. So William Hughes is um, unsurprisingly um, a friend of Sir Thomas Mostyn. In 1622, so much, much later, um, you have the next case. Uh, and this one is prosecuted by Sir John uh, Bodvile, who writes to his father-in-law, Sir John Wynne of Goydir, complaining that his tenants are being plagued by witchcraft. And as a result of John Bodvile's complaint, um, three siblings, the brother and two sisters, are arrested and found guilty and hanged. Now you'll note that in both these cases, it's the Welsh gentry who are responsible for these cases being brought to court and prosecuted. And that is potentially the difference between uh, these cases being resulting in um, hanging and the others not. Um, so you have, um, it's, it's also known that well, uh, witches do curse you. Um, it's, it's not that witches are kind of seen as uh, completely benevolent figures in sort of in the real life kind of thing. Um, you have the Venu Haspis and you have also cunning men, the, dun, the Din Haspis or plural is Dinyon Haspis. And if you think that you have been cursed by a witch, what you do is you go and find a cunning man, uh, a, a Din Haspis, who can then uncurse you or can tell you whether or not that you're cursed. Um, and these men uh, offer other services as well, uh, like healing and astrology and fortune telling and uncovering lost property, which is very similar to what the cunning women do. Um, and there are witchcraft, you know, so, so it's not like um, people think that, you know, your village witch is entirely benign. That's not the case. Um, it's just that they don't, they, they don't, for whatever reason, don't want to prosecute them. Um, and a lot of this can be picked up in kind of um, tales like the youth of Edward Ellis uh, in Tales of Welsh Society and Scenery in 1827 by Thomas Richards. There's a character there who is um, a witch or a sorceress, and um, she is both feared and respected by her community. So the community ostracize her. Um, they don't, uh, you know, they, they're very kind of, they, they talk amongst themselves about her. But when they need her, they treat her like a goddess. And they go to her with reverence and they go to her with tributes and with gifts. So there's this whole kind of ambiguity around this figure. And in fiction, she's often a um, chaotic force of nature aligned with the protagonists or is a chaotic neutral. She's very often depicted as an avenger of injustice, um, which is often where that fear kind of comes from. She can be a figure of self-determination. She's um, generally in later fiction as well, spiritual and respected by nonconformist ministers in some cases like Garth Owen by Alan Rain, um, which is a 1900 kind of not so, so quite a late one. Um, you have other depictions that are not as benign or not as positive. Um, uh, and in other stories, um, you can get some negative and racist depictions where um, the witch is conflated with the Welsh Romany. Um, so I'm not going to kind of uh, get into all of that, but those are kind of the, the, the figures that you're, you're getting into, that kind of um, idea of who the Welsh witch kind of is. Moving past the... Um, Moving past the witch trials then into the English Civil War, there were many of those. This is the English Civil War of the 1640s. And you have um, the Welsh are royalists, they are not parliamentarians, uh, which is interesting um, because, you know, moving on later, you, you have a very left-wing radical 
kind of strand Welsh politics. Um, but back then, not so much. Uh, and the Welsh are lampooned in parliamentarian pamphlets um, and greatly distrusted by Cromwell's Republic. Um, Welsh loyalty to the crown is blamed on spiritual and religious ignorance and um, their lax morals, which is a repeated rhetoric levelled against the Welsh. Cromwell propagates a big push to strengthen the Puritan enclaves in Wales, and this sets the scene for nonconformity to take root. Um, when you get into the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, Wales again supported or largely supported uh, the restoration of Charles II because they saw him as a descendant of King Cadwallader, our friend from the seventh century, um, and saw him as a, a man who would restore the ancient British church. So that's the ancient Welsh church. They're not talking about British in a, in a kind of inclusive way. They're talking about British as an ethnic group, um, which of course didn't happen um but you know um that's okay uh and so, so you have this um interesting connection between wales and um the stuarts or the, this particular line um that's charles ii there so you move then swiftly um into the cultural renaissance in the long 18th century which is when you know, sort of Welsh Gothic fiction is being written in Wales as well uh, as um, English uh, writers writing about Wales. Um, Wales obviously benefited from the gradual expansion of the British Empire and the transatlantic slave trade like the rest of Britain. Um, and during this time, you also have a cultural renaissance happening uh, in Scotland, um, and it happens in Wales too. Um, and in Wales, it takes the form of um, a resurrection or a reimagining of uh, customs and particularly medieval things, uh, anything medieval, because we're tapping into that kind of the medievalism and that popularity um, of the medieval period. There's a stonemason called Edward Williams, who's, there he is, um, lovely artistic rendering of, and um, he was an autodidact, he taught himself uh, pretty much everything. I think he was also an alchemist and all sorts of things. He was a poet. He taught himself all of those complicated Welsh forms of poetry from the Middle Ages. Uh, he was an antiquary. Um, so he had got his hands on a lot of ancient manuscripts. He also forged a lot of them very, very well um, to the point that it's very difficult to tell with the Yolo manuscripts uh, what he forged and what's real. And scholars have been picking away at that for, um, for many, many years. Um, and he chose a bardic name, and this was, a, so bards tend to, um, you, you have a bardic name, not just your own name, uh, or your birth name, sorry, and then you're ten, you tend to be known by your bardic name as your new name. So um, he is known as uh, Yolo Morganog, that's the name that he chose. So Yolo Morganog um, was part of a literary circle that sought to revive a distinctly Welsh identity through the rediscovery of the Welsh medieval past. He was friends with people like William Godwin. Um, in 1795, he was in London explaining the doctrines of bardism and holding druidical Gorsedai on Primrose Hill. So he conflated bardism with druidism, which is an interesting thing. Um, and he merged these two kind of concepts um, sort of the bard or the poet as this mystical figure, as well as a poet as well, which, you know, in fairness, like that's a good bard, a good medieval bard, um, doesn't just praise people or compose or remember these kind of um, sad uh, laments or just, you know, praising their patron or um, a good bard is also so good that if a bard uh, composes a curse poem and delivers it, the hearer that it is intended for should drop down dead. And that is a mark of how good you are. Because the power is in the language, not in who speaks it, but in the words themselves. And so the Welsh language is a particularly um, contested um, kind of site. Um, but um, Yolo Morganog uh, sort of championed the Welsh language and championed the um, the Eisteddfod and the which is uh, the seating known as the seating 
um, and he reinvented it. This The Eisteddfod is a bardic competition, which did first take place in the 12th century. We have some records of it, so it did actually happen, not in the way that Yolo Morgano reimagined it as, um, but we still have it now. Um, so we have it, uh, we have all the schools have Eisteddfods around um, St. David's Day, or most of the schools do. There's a big national one, there's a big international one in the summer. Um, and it's now a big kind of general festival of the arts with lots of different competitions. But the, ba the main one is the, the poet or the bard, the chairing of the bard. The standard of the competition is so high that some years nobody wins it. Um, and there have been a few years of the Eisteddfod where the, no bard has been chaired because no bard is good enough to be chaired. Um, so that's kind of different to, I guess, other competitions where you just you pick the best out of your out of the people you've got. Um, there is uh, that was in the, there's a couple of times like I think the last one was in the 1970s, I think, where nobody won. Anyway, so in 1819, Yolo Morganog succeeded in making the Gorsev an essential part of the Eisteddfod proceedings. Um, so the Gorsev is the meeting of the bards. Um, whose elected leader is called the Arch Druid. So he's he's got this interesting conflation of um, Druidism and, and bard, Bardism. Um, and this inspires people. So you have um, 1780s to 1820s is sort of the year, you, the, the kind of decades of the Romantic tourists, the lovely picture of Tintin Abbey there. Um, and the romantic views of the landscape of Wales are an important part of Gothic tales of the Welsh setting. Um, if you consider to, well, uh, I, you know, some like Jane Aaron would consider anything with the Welsh setting to be Welsh Gothic um, as a working kind of definition. Um, we can debate, we, that can be, that, that can be discussed, I think, I, I, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, that, that's, but, um, you have a lot of settings of Wales and they do kind of focus on the ruined abbeys and the wild uh, combs, the, the, the lakes and the mountains and all of that kind of rugged terrain. But in Welsh Gothic texts, these English tourists or English um, interlopers are often villainized. Um, English characters in Welsh Gothic texts are seen as buying up lands and treating Welsh women as exotic commodities, um, which leads them to draw direct parallels with colonialism in India um, and slavery in the West Indies, which is a false equivalence. Um, but uh, you find this in abolitionist texts as well, or texts by people who are um, abolitionaries, um, abolitionists. Um, and you have this kind of um, idea that what the English do, uh, what the colonials do, uh, they're coded English um, in India um, is, horrendous and they're coming over here and doing it to us because they think they can um, and so that's a theme of some of the novels which is an interesting uh perception but that's kind of the, so that you you get the idea of of the english as villain um you, you also have um death omens and things like that when uh, a welsh girl is being seduced by the, the English seducer. Um, there's a story called The Promise, uh, the, not The Promise, title's gone out of my head, uh, in which um, there's, there's one where a, a raven is shot out of the sky and it falls straight down a well and splatters her dress with blood. That might be an omen love that you don't marry him, you know, just a thought. Anyway, uh, that ends as badly as you can imagine. And it turns out it's a bit of a, there's a bit of a Jane Eyre twist to all of that as well, in that it turns out he's already married and, you know, uh, there's a lot of being left at the altar and then people go mad. And um, yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's joyful. Um, so you get a lot of things like that. Um, while this is all going on, as we get into the, the 19th century, you have the rise of industrialization in Wales and also of nonconformity. And these are two elements uh, that sit awkwardly alongside the pastoral nature of rural Wales and the, the rugged landscapes and things like that, because um, Wales becomes a land of mining and steelworks and ironworks and foundries and woolen mills. And in Welsh Gothic texts, um, the industry itself is an antagonist. The coal mines, the coalfield Gothic, 
that is an antagonist. You also have things, you know, I guess, socialist Gothic with the rise of um, uh, political dissent and workers' agitation. Um, you have the Merthyr Rising of 1831, uh, which is uh, miners, uh, an uprising of, um, and the martyrdom of Dick Penderin, Richard Lewis, um, who is hanged for bayoneting a soldier who says it, who actually said it wasn't him. Um, but he was hanged while the leader of the um, the rising itself, Lewis Lewis, uh, was not executed, but was um, I think in prison or transported. Um, you have the Newport Chartist Rising of 1839. Um, so the Chartists had uh, wrote out the People's Charter with a list of their demands, which include kind of um, you know male suffrage and um, various other you know uh, MPs should have a wage so that um, you could open up elections to uh, not just people who could afford to be politicians, um, so that sort of thing. Um, and they marched on Newport, some of them were armed, and they met the army, um, and there was a shootout at the Westgate Hotel, and of course a lot of them were, uh, were killed. You have the Rebecca riots of 1839 to 43, that was um, in protest against paying tolls and the toll gates that was in West Wales largely um, and that was they, it's called the Rebecca riots because um, the men involved in that um, disguised themselves as women generally dressing up in their wives clothes and called themselves the daughters of Rebecca in relation to the Old Testament the Genesis uh, verse that um, Rebecca um, is kind of uh, um, Laban her brother kind of prophesies to prophesies to Rebecca that um, your children will break the gates of those who, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but that will break the gates of those who um, oppress them. Um, so that's a line in Genesis, a verse in Genesis, um, and um, hence Rebecca riots. The coal fields of South Wales are exceptionally lucrative. The first £1 million cheque in the world was signed at Cardiff in 1904. Um, the coal fields themselves then become a spectre that haunt communities, particularly in the 20th century Gothic. Um, you have mining disasters, you have um, disability uh, ongoing, you have things like emphysema, um, which is you know rampant among kind of the miners. You have the conditions that the miners are living in, um, the conditions of the mines themselves that they are working in. Um, so that becomes a, a major um, point within Gothic texts. Meanwhile, uh, you have nonconformity and the rise of nonconformity thanks to Cromwell back in the 1640s, 50s. Um, nonconformity has a strong enclave in Wales, and by the 1830s, the majority uh, were some shade of nonconformist Protestant. And this kind of goes hand in hand with the political dissent because um, chapels are democracies where members vote on issues affecting the chapel community and they elect their pastors. It's also a space where people meet to discuss the hot topics of the day and they can do that without sanction. Um, and uh, so I think that that's one of the reasons why nonconformity is, is so important in Wales. And by 1851, around 80% of Welsh people attended a nonconformist chapel rather than um, a church, an Anglican or a church in Wales church, which is, you know, Anglican, uh, Anglican is the kind of the state religion. So, um, however, despite the fact that no, you know, only 20% of people go to an Anglican church or, you know, a, a church in Wales, church um, they are still expected to pay tithes to the church and so you have the 1886 to 90 tithe wars which is another violent uprising uh, in protest at still having to pay tithes um, and again the army was called in um, and that also ended fairly badly so gothic alert um, these are themes that continue and you also have then later particularly in the 20th century, the critique of the stranglehold that chapels have and the chapel community has and the dark side of chapel culture. Um, and those are very controversial um, texts, um, particularly because they come out at a time when nonconformity is still um, very much, um, you know, looked at askance, if you like, um, by uh, sort of uh, the English or, you know, 
so um that's and it's it's seen as that there are there's one book in particular that is um in yeah uh that's very controversial and is kind of banned or boycotted because it does that and it critiques chapel culture in that way um mid 1800s then you've got the treason of the blue books of 1847 and this uh while all this is going on so industry nonconformism, cultural renaissance great um but this strikes at the heart of welsh culture and welsh the, the welsh national psyche if you like um so the blue books of 1847 were a three volume collection of the reports of the commissioner's inquiry into the state of education in wales so they are uh, blue books are government reports that you can subscribe to and they are circulated and they cost you about a shilling or something and you can um you can sign up for them and then you get sent to them or they're circulated in libraries and that sort of thing so they have a wide readership and they're printed and bound in blue covers and that's why they're called the blue books these particular uh editions the 1847 ones this uh report um into the state of education in wales was conducted by english-speaking anglican school inspectors who uh, were not favourable to uh, the Welsh language because they didn't speak it and they didn't understand it. And they were also very uh, suspicious of nonconformity, which, you know, 80% of the people were. And these uh, collections go beyond uh, their scope. And what they actually produced was three volumes of scathing defamation against the Welsh and the character of the Welsh in very general terms. Um, among them, they criticised um, nonconformist prayer meetings, which are absolutely nothing to do with school, uh, claiming that nonconformist prayer meetings led to elevated feelings and sexual licentiousness and promiscuity. So basically, everyone gets really excited at prayer meetings and goes home and has sex. I don't know which prayer meetings they were going to, um, but obviously I've been going to all the wrong ones. Um, so they claimed that Welsh women had very few morals, which again is a uh, repeated rhetoric from, you know, the, the 1640s. Um, the Welsh language itself is claimed as a primitive tongue um, and was holding the Welsh back from reaching their civilised potential. This gives rise to uh, a massive backlash. Uh, where you have a lot of people who are incredibly indignant by this. This is why they're called the treason of the blue books. It's um, there, there's think pieces published about it. Um, there's all sorts of drama. Um, but one reaction, very uh, kind of concrete response, um, is the Welsh knot, which is brought up in schools as a way to make sure that children speak English. Um, so the, the knot is a board of wood with the word not on it, N-O-T, and it's hung around the child's neck. And so when the child uh, hears another child speaking Welsh, they can snitch on them and pass on the board. The child of the board at the end of the day uh, receives corporal punishment, so caning, beating. The child of the board at the end of the week also receives corporal punishment. Um, and so to pass the board along, they would start, uh, there, there was some, you know, uh, reports of children telling on their friends for speaking Welsh outside of school as well at home. Um, so you have the reaction of Welsh speaking parents um, to make sure their children could get ahead and avoid prejudice in the workplace and um could you know avoid prejudice against them into in sort of a moral life moral censure um, and they stop teaching their children welsh or they stop speaking welsh around their children or they encourage their children to speak english first um and this is uh this marks the rapid and significant decline of the welsh language so at first 90 percent of uh the population of wales um are sort of Welsh speakers, nearly 100% in certain areas. This declines down to 19.19% um, by uh, sort of the, the 1980s. So it's a generational thing and it's a very steady decline. Um, and this is gothicized in um, especially fiction of the 20th century. Um, because by the 20th century, the decline is so severe 
that you have whole generations that have been uh, disinherited from their own language. And you also have the rise of paramilitary groups who do uh, commit acts of domestic terrorism in defense of the Welsh language, um, in that they firebomb uh, English speakers' second homes and that sort of second homes belonging to English people in Wales um, and various other things. I'll get onto that a bit later. Um, this may seem like a, I've put this slide in the wrong place, but um, going back a bit to, um, to Druids and other figures that you find in um, Welsh fiction, um, you have this interesting conflation of bardism and druism, as I've pointed out, but also later on in the 20th century, you get the uh, sort of the mad doctor figure who's like a kind of Frankenstein type. Um, and this isn't necessarily, the, the Welsh fiction seems to have its own version of Frankenstein. You can see it in Arthur Machen, Machen's um, The Great God Pan and those sorts of things. So weird fiction um, in Wales. Um, and this shift um, is very much interlinked with the idea of the Druid. So in early Welsh Gothic novels, um, including ones about Wales by English authors, you have positive rustic spins on the Druid that use the Druid as spiritual figure or fatalistic figure in the narrative. Um, and he's rehabilitated by Yolo Morganuk and the cultural renaissance. Um, William Godwin um, sets a story of his called uh, a novel of his uh, Imogen, a pastoral romance, which is 1784 in prehistoric Cluid, uh, Cluid um, with a druid who practices human sacrifice, but is ennobled in a classical way, um, drawing on Greek and Roman themes and literature. And his fictional pagan community live under the motto of the French Revolution, which is obviously anachronistic, um, but, you know, liberty. Uh, equality and brotherhood, you know, liberty, equality, fraternity. Um, and as you have this shift in, you know, well, what it, morals, are, the, the Welsh morals are bad, Welsh language is bad, Welsh culture is bad, um, but you also have the backlash of uh, this growth of cultural um, uh, pos positivity, I suppose, the, the sort of cultural renaissance of that is still continuing. And you do have, you know, Anglican publications in the Welsh language in defense of the Welsh language. And you do have people defending it from various different um, angles and different political stances. Um, and you have this, so while all of this is, is going on, there's a figure who appears in Pontypridd and his name is Dr. William Price. Um, so this is where a lot of content warnings come in for infant death. Uh, cremation and um, let's say dubious consent to the large age gap. Um, so William Price was born in 1800, dies in 1893, a very long lived chap. Here he is when he's age 22, uh, it's him in medical school. He was a prodigy. He was apprenticed to a surgeon aged 13. He was a Republican, so very anti-royalist. He was a chartist. He was a political left wing radical. Um, he didn't wear socks. He thought that was unhealthy. He drank a lot of champagne for medical reasons. Um, he was a vegetarian and prescribed vegetarian diets to his patients uh, instead of medicine in some cases. Uh, very into free love. He saw marriage as enslavement for women. He was polyamorous. He fathered many children with his lovers. And he walked the streets of Pontypridd in full druidic regalia. He was a character. Um, I once taught one of his descendants, um, which is <laughs> really cool. Um, and in, when he was 83 years old, he fathered his last child, I think, a son, uh, which he named Jesus Christ, Jesse Grist. Um, and this is with his 16 year old housekeeper and mistress, Gwen Llian Llewellyn. The boy died, unfortunately, uh, of natural causes aged five months. And he insisted, William Price insisted on cremating him, which wasn't legal at the time. There's no there are no crematoriums in England and Wales. So he built a pyre on the top of the hill and timed the cremation to coincide with the emptying of the chapels on Sunday night. And then he lit it. And there was a sensational trial at Cardiff. He was accused of desecrating a corpse um, and he won the case by pointing out he, he, I, he um, during the during the trial, he actually represented himself and he won. And he pointed out that cremate he's 83. Uh, so 
um, pointing out that cremation was not legal, but there is no statute that makes it illegal. So he hasn't actually broken the law. So he can't be tried because there isn't a law. There's literally no law against it. So um, he then was cremated himself in 1893 in similar fashion on a pyre in Pontypri, which inspired a lot of ballads and tales. Um, and this set a precedent um, that, um, the, the first of all, the case, uh, his son's case, set a precedent that was uh, that almost directly paved the way for the Cardiff Corporation Act of 1894, so that the year after he died and was cremated, um, and then the Cremation Act of 1902, so the national one, which is the reason why we uh, we can be cremated today. Uh, so there's an interesting point for you. Um, and he was a figure, and this his whole kind of lifestyle, his his just uh, the, the trial, the whole kind of thing um, influenced a lot of writers, sort of early 20th century writers, um, and who wrote about, uh, you know, the Druid figure and conflated the Druid with the Mad Doctor. Um, so you get that, uh, you know, that sort of thing owes a lot uh, in, in its depictions to Dr. Price. Um, so that's a very interesting, uh, just a point for you. Um, in terms of, uh, going further into 20th century where you have the decline of industry um the coal mines close and various and you have this decline of um uh all of the you know a lot of uh, valleys lose their lose their mines um you have a lot of uh villages cut off from any kind of industry um, and the image of the zombie um, pops up in popular mainstream media um you know made popular by america and those sorts of um, American films and, um, you know, it is introduced into um, mainstream culture. And it, with it comes a new metaphor um, for a land and people haunted by its past. Um, and the themes that start to emerge now are, um, you know, in the, in the early to mid 20th century, um, a sort of either die, uh, I, <laughs> Wales needs to either die and leave us alone to create a new future for ourselves or we need to face up to the death of our culture and our heritage, and we need to try to restore something. And when people uh, sort of deal with these themes, the restoration attempts often end in tragedy or are thwarted before they have properly begun. There's a lot of fatalism um, and a lot of anger in some of these, especially in the poems. Um, you have themes like the landscape itself um, being vengeful, um, people being under the thrall of nature, um, landscape as the memorial for the past, which contains um, spirits of the past that then haunt you. Um, and the landscape contains um, not just spirits, but is itself that which the Welsh people are haunted and pursued and condemned by. Um, so there's a poem by Ruth Bidgood, um, which is called The Zombie Makers, uh, who, uh, and Ruth, Bidgood references Llewellyn Ap Griffith's death um, uh, in this poem as well. So you've got that kind of a link to the medieval past here. Um, so seventh hell is for the zombie makers who cut the heart out while it faintly beats and clamp whole valleys to a heart and lung machine of reservoir and forestry. Work now, die later, then switch off. As the blood congeals, here come the corpse cosmeticians, bland embalmers, to prettify the violated body with labelled forest trail and picnic area, and fake a ghoulish animation that is not life and mocks at death. If you must kill a land, let it die then. Llewellyn's head, a death in life on Cheapside once, rotted at last to the dignity of dust, like the sundered body and the altar in remote Cumhir. Um, so you get this is very much a vibe for a lot of uh, sort of mid 20th century poetry. Um, <laughs> Gothic alert. Um, you also have um, that sort of, as I said about Gothic descent, where you have a rise of critiques of chapel culture. Um, you have the, um, the fissure of, of, you know, being disinherited from your own language and your own heritage as a result of that disinheritance. Um, you have the Welsh Nationalist Party founded in 1925, Plaid Cymru, um, and you have um, the Coalfield Gothic issues. 
Um, you have the drowning in 1965 of Capel Kellin um, to create a reservoir. I'm going to come back to that side in a second. Um, this is uh, um, one of the uh, so yeah so so this is the Free Wales Army. That's the FWA for action, not words. Um, and uh, this is a protest um, against the drowning of Capel Kellin. Um, Capel Kellin was one of the very few entirely Welsh speaking villages left in Wales in the 1960s. And proposals from Liverpool City Council, Liverpool in England, uh, came to flood it and the Truen Valley to create a reservoir for Liverpool. So the water goes to Liverpool. They received uh, Liverpool City Council received permission for this via an act of parliament, so they didn't need to consult the Welsh authorities. Um, there were 36 seated uh, Welsh MPs at the time, 35 voted against the bill, one uh, didn't vote. Um, they didn't manage to drum up enough support against it, and the bill was passed in 1962. The village was evacuated. Um, there was obviously, you know, the, the whole the whole village, um, you know, so they had to disinter a lot of the bodies in the cemetery, but some they left there um, and are still there. Um, and the valley was flooded for the reservoir in 1965, and the villagers were scattered. Um, so this was a sort of a death knell for um, the, you know, part, it was a, a very much contributing to the decline um, of the Welsh language and sort of uh, Welsh ways of life as it was seen. Um, so I'm going to come back to this poem, which is Reservoirs by R.S. Thomas um, in 1968. So after the drowning of Capel Kellin. And this is his take on that. Um, there are places in Wales I don't go, reservoirs that are the subconscious of a people troubled far down with gravestones, chapels, villages even. The serenity of their expression revolts me. It is a pose for strangers, a watercolour's appeal to the mass instead of the poem's harsher conditions. There are the hills too, gardens gone under the scum of the forests and the smashed faces of the farms with the stone trickle of their tears down the hill's side. Where can I go then from the smell of decay, from the putrefying of a dead nation? I have walked the shore for an hour and seen the English scavenging among the remains of our culture, covering the sand like the tide and, with the roughness of the tide, elbowing our language into the grave that we have dug for it. So there's this element of complicity um, that um, the Welsh, uh, not just the Welsh government, uh, not that there was no Welsh government, but the Welsh MPs, um, elected MPs were responsible for this, but also the Welsh people themselves were responsible for this because they they gave in or because they um, they decided to try and teach their kids English and because they didn't fight hard enough or they didn't, you know, they just kind of that there's this kind of um, there's a, an anger, but also a fatalistic kind of anger. Um, and this um, this is, uh, you know, one of the main kind of issues um, that you see cropping up, the themes that keep cropping up. 1966 saw another major uh, uh, kind of um, <sighs> fissure, I guess, in the national psyche, and that's the Aberfan disaster. So, I mean, this is another one for uh, content warning. That's a picture of the actual uh, disaster itself and Aberfan, the village. Um, so the National Coal Board, the NCB, had been petitioned about the state of the coal tips of the mountains around the village of Avavan, uh, but they, they sent out their own people to make assessment of it, and they said that the tips were safe. The tips were not safe. On the 21st of October 1966, around 9.15 in the morning, um, the tip at the top of the mountain slipped down the mountain and engulfed the junior school, killing 109 children and four teachers. Um, the Aberfan Memorial Fund was set up to assist bereaved families, but um, because they insisted uh, that the coal board clean up the rest of the tips and the cleanup operation that was required there, um, the Aberfan Memorial Fund was ordered to pay £250,000 towards the cost of removing the tip initially, and after a lot of shouting they got this down to £150,000. This was only paid back to the fund 30 years later. 
Um, and the Welsh government, uh, 10 years after that, so in the, the, the um, 90s, early thousands, I think, um, gave Aberfan uh, Memorial Fund two million pounds uh, as interest um, on top of that money. There was evidence uh, for the National Coal Board's negligence in this case. Um, however, uh, after a, after four minutes of deliber deliberation, the coroner returned a blanket verdict of accidental death, and no one was charged, no one was held accountable, and nobody resigned. And one person did put their uh, resignation in, but had been assured um, that their job was safe. So, um, as documentation later came out, um, so he kept he stayed in post. Um, and this gave rise to a massive, uh, so this is the paramilitary bit, uh, outpouring of grief, but also frustration and anger. The Free Wales Army had been founded in 1963, that's them on the side there, um, with the goal of establishing an independent Welsh Republic. Um, they threatened to disrupt the investiture of Charles as Prince of Wales in 1969. Support massively increased for Plaid Cymru, the Nationalist Party, and other paramilitary groups um, were created after 1965 and 66 and gained in uh, their, their numbers and their um, popularity. So you have uh, people like uh, like the FWA, but also the Maibion Glyndwr, the Sons of Glyndwr, um, who um, firebombed around 220 English-owned homes between 1979 and 1994, um, which were second homes, so they were empty at the time and planted bombs in Conservative Party offices in London and estate agent offices across England and Wales. Um, so they're particularly targeting English settlers as part of their manifesto. So, see how we're doing on time, a little bit better than we were this morning. Um, some key themes then, history in the Welsh Gothic. Um, betrayal by or dangerous authority figures that you cannot trust. Um, that could be the Welsh elite themselves, who are ineffectual, inward-looking, backward-looking, cursed and treacherous, um, also Welsh MPs. Uh, imposition of the outside authority is explicitly English, usually English-coded, um, who bring ruin and destruction, which could be, um, you know, the sort of um, dastardly lords and villains of early Gothic, but also could be um, Whitehall and civil servants um, who appear as antagonists in some uh, sort of 20th century novels. You have the theme of haunted by the past, a good Gothic staple. And in the Welsh case, it's specifically the revenge of or coming from the landscape or um, from mythical or historical figures. So that kind of vengeance is wreaked against the Welsh themselves for their complicity in the burial of their culture and heritage or their impotence to prevent it from happening, um, but also against outsiders coming to despoil the landscape. And in this case, the revenge may be futile. Um, you have language and communication also cropping up as a main theme as well, um, being silenced in the form of disinheritance from language or being physically silenced in another way. Uh, music as a form of communication or language crops up sometimes as a motif um, and spoken words as having some inherent supernatural power. Um, so those are those uh, those are the main sorts of themes that I think you can um, identify broadly um, across Welsh Gothic fiction. Um, I think, well, we kind of we kind of don't maybe have time. <laughs> because I've got the folklore stuff as well to go. So if we're okay um, to, I can power straight on with um, the folklore section and then we can have time for questions at the end. Um, I can't see the chat, so is that okay, everyone? Uh, yes. Yes, okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, Welsh Gothic folklore uh, uh, then, and those folkloric influences. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you like a little uh, lowdown of some kind of fun folklore stuff. Uh, I say fun, morbid, I mean morbid. Um, and uh, we're going to have a look at some of the lesser known things as well, which if you did fancy writing anything, uh, <laughs> been madly inspired, um, maybe you could um, pick up some of these themes, I don't know. 
content warnings, uh, again, infant death, uh, murder, killing, gore, corpses, and what we do with them. Uh, moving on. Uh, so omens, curses, and prophecy, obviously major folkloric issues uh, or themes, witches and druids, major archetypal figures. Um, death omens, including corpse candles and corpse birds. Uh, visions of funeral processions, if you see your own funeral, that's bad. Uh, the Kuna Nun, um, ghost stories, I'm going to try and see how many of these I can cover. Um, and finally, I hope I can include my vampiric furniture at the end, because that's my favourite. Um, so corpse birds, corpse birds, what are they? Um, they are death omens that are attached to particular families. They are small and grey, some are flightless, some are not. Um, some flap against the window and others have a very strange but very melodic and very distinctive song. Um, if you see one, it doesn't mean that you're going to die necessarily. Um, so the one lady um, saw corpse birds flapping against the window, a corpse bird flapping against the window, which warned her about the death of her father and his two brothers. Um, but on the other hand, um, they follow you around. So you have um, people who see their own corpse birds um, in Australia, for example, um, where um, it's uh, where they are a, an omen of your own personal death. Um, but, uh, you know, not necessary, not necessary. Um, you also have things like uh, like wakes and um, funeral uh, kind of I'm not going to go into Sinitas. We do have uh, Sinitas as well. Um, but the Goyle Norse, uh, which is the wake uh, in, in Pembrokeshire. Uh, in the mid 1700s, and this is from uh, Folklore of Mid and West Wales by Jonathan Craddock Davis, 1911, um, which is, uh, you, uh, I think Kuttenberg has got a free version of this for you. Um, there was uh, a custom called the Hirwen Good. Um, so this is how it goes. Um, a certain number of young men take out the corpse from the coffin and move it, clad in a long white shroud, the Hirwen Good, uh, to a convenient place near the fire. The fire should be out at the time, preferably. Uh, then a rope is tied around the upper part of the body, and when this is done securely, the other end of the rope is passed up the chimney by means of a long stick for that purpose, your rope poking stick. Uh, and the next step is for a party of the men to go up to the top of the chimney on the roof of the house, obviously from the outside, by means of a ladder, and take hold of the rope, which has been sent up inside. And when they are ready, they give sign to those inside by crying in Welsh, here when good, and those inside the house answer saying, Chwarin Barod, we are ready. And the party on top of the house pull the corpse up slowly through the chimney by means of the rope, and they get it to the top, and then they lower it back down again and put it back in the coffin. Why? Who knows? I do not know. Um, I don't think anyone knows. Uh, why not? Uh, I'm sure there are some interesting, I wonder actually if there's um, some really interesting parallels with other kinds of things. I don't know if Dari might know uh, or have some idea, I don't know. We'll see later. Um, there is, uh, so uh, why this kind of died out, um, an aged person named Mrs. Mary Thomas of Bengal near Fishguard um, said that um, she had heard a good deal from her mother about this strange old custom. Um, and according to Mrs. Thomas, it was customary to put a living man in the coffin uh, during this ceremony um, and then once you've pulled the corpse up through the chimney and then you've dropped it down again, you then swap them over. And it's described as a game. It's, it's, it's <laughs> um, at the end of the game that, that you, you uh, they, they went to, uh, this was done uh, in one particular case and they went to the coffin uh, to replace the corpse and the guy that they put inside it had died. Um, <laughs> So this sad incident caused people to put an end to the old custom. Um, you also have a really, an interesting case of a gentleman farmer who was a notoriously ungodly man um, who lived in a farmhouse called Dolgaranog in North Pembrokeshire. And he at last died and was placed in his coffin and the candles are lighted. So the custom is um, to light a lot of candles to sort of um, presumably as part of the, you know, lighting the soul's way onwards and windows are opened and things. And it's a big party. And people came to the wake night, the Goyle Norse, uh, and went on in the usual manner. 
according to the customs of those days, which include the young men and young maidens pairing off and uh, <laughs> whispering words of love to each other in the corner and <laughs> various. Uh, and um, as these things went on, they are suddenly surprised by hearing the sound of horses' feet, as if a large concourse of people were approaching the house on horses driving full speed. The next moment, the sound of men's footsteps was heard entering in through the door and into the very room where the wake night went on, but nothing could be seen. The invisible intruders, as they passed into the room where the dead man lay, put out all the candles. At last, the same sound of footsteps could be heard departing from the house, and as this mysterious sound passed out through the room, people heard the bustle and even felt the crush, and on leaving, the strange visitors relighted the candles but there was nothing to be seen and the sound of horses feet were heard as if a large concourse of cavaliers were driving away from the house in the same manner that they approached it and gradually the sound died away and then the relatives and friends and others who were present at the goyal norse keeping vigil over the dead were anxious to know what the sound of invisible footsteps meant and what had happened so they entered the room where the coffin was and they opened it and to their great alarm they found that it was empty and the corpse was gone and it was never found again and they really believed that the body was taken by the devil or evil spirits as the man had lived such a bad life and the coffin was afterwards filled with stones and buried. So this could be also connected to the idea of the hunt and the kunanun because um, if, uh, so Aron, the leader of the hunt, uh, who's kind of the king of the Welsh underworld, Anun, um, often takes misers and ungodly men for the hunt and um, the hounds themselves will chase down uh, people that um, they deem to be um, wicked or in some way deserving of punishment. So there could be an interesting parallel with that. Um, the Kunanun are not hellhounds. They're more akin to fairy hounds. There's a lovely little picture of them. Um, they're meant to be white with red ears um, they are death omens because they belong to Aron, the king of the underworld. Um, he's often the leader of the hunt, but then uh, you also have Gwynap Neve as leader of the hunt as well in folklore. Um, and no one seems to know quite when that switch happened. Um, but in the Mabinogi, which is the, the um, Welsh mythology, uh, you have Pul, Prince of David, uh, meeting Aron while out hunting. And Pulch uh, sees Aron's hounds, um, but he allows his own hounds to kill the stag that Aron is hunting, which is very bad manners, and so ends up making a pact with Aron to fight Aron's enemy for him. And very much in kind of uh, the, the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight kind of parallels there a little bit, and he trades places with Aron for a year and a day. Um, and But these hounds then later become spirit hounds um, that pass through the air pursuing wicked souls um, with or whoever has met with their master or mistress's displeasure. I say mistress because um, they are also led by the hag of the night, the Malta Norse or Matilda of the night. Um, according to Marie Trevelyan's Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales 1909, there are different descriptions of the hounds depending on uh, where you are in Wales. So they range from the, the usual, which is white with rose colored ears, to black and very ugly with huge red spots or red in body with large black patches like splashes of ink. And the most terrible um, of these spirit hounds were said to be of a blood red color. And when seen were dripping with gore while their eyes resembled balls of liquid fire. And they're generally described as their blood red because they've been rolling around literally in people's blood. Um, it's a print by uh, Stephen Bruch there, the artist. Um, so that's Matilda, who in some folklore uh, is said to have been a Norman noblewoman who was very impious and she loved hunting above all else. And now she is cursed to lead the hunt for all eternity. Um, in Glamorgan, Brecon and Radna, Aron is the master of the hounds. He rides a grey horse and is robed in grey. In North Wales, he walks or rides, but he's always dark and shadowy and black and gigantic. Um, and you can't see his face. And, you know, it's just like the shadow of a giant. Um, and then you have Matilda or Master Norse in North and South Wales alike, um, often accompanying the, the hunt. Those doomed to ride with the hunt come back to earth to suck the blood of corpses as well as the living. 
And if anyone tries to join the procession, if you see the hunt um, out of curiosity or accident or design, you deliberately want to, um, blood falls in showers like rain, human bodies are torn to pieces and death soon follows the victim of the nocturnal expedition. So don't is generally the, uh, the general advice. And the hounds appear in Gothic tales of the 19th century where they feature as avengers and soul hunters. And um, they're generally forgotten about for a while, I think because of the, the kind of uh, popularity of the Mabinogi where they only appear as like just normal hounds that just happen to belong to Aron in Pendebeg David, that, that second branch. Um, so that's not very scary, um, but they, they tend to just get a bit neglected as tropes or as you know elements until you get um ronald chetman hayes's anthology uh, welsh tales of terror in 1973 um he's not a welsh author but he does have this whole compendium of um welsh stories or welsh set stories um it's not just those that Aron's hunt takes who can come back as vampiric spirits though and in terms of mythology and folk tales, um, you know, Aaron hunts the avaricious and the sinful, um, but you don't have to, you, you know, that you could just come back if you're um, particularly nasty in life. Um, so there's an old story attached to a Carmarthenshire yeoman, uh, so uh, who is the, uh, a, a farmer, so a gentleman farmer, if you like. Um, so the family lived for generations in the same house situated in a lonely spot. The old yeoman in question was very grasping in his generation. They said he would suck the blood out of a stone. You can see where this is going, can't you? Um, so he dies and leaves his money and possessions to his eldest son. And when his son dies, they lay the son out and the death chamber was shut for the night. And in the morning, they come in and they find marks on the body, which everyone said had been made by a vampire. So the family come to the conclusion that the old yeoman had been sucking his son's corpse to see if he could get something out of it. And in later generations, if any marks were found upon the body of a dead member of the family, they said the old wretch had been at work again. So, uh, lovely. Um, but you don't just get evil spirits in sort of that, that sort of corporeal form. Sometimes um, you get them in furniture. And I wonder if there's, uh, so you have, you have stories of how Merlin is sort of trapped in a tree um by Nimue uh, and you have the spirits being trapped in trees or in wood or uh spirits of wood and trees and that kind of thing so I wonder if it's related to this um but there are some interesting tales of vampiric entities that haunt specifically beds and chairs so wooden that's a this is not the chair um but it's a 16th century oak wainscot chair so something like this um, and this is a tale from the 1500s, uh, well, for, from uh, the, the 19th century, but about, you know, uh, from Plantwit Major. Um, and it's, um, there's no origin story for the chair, it's just a chair. So the story goes that uh, a nonconformist minister turns up to stay at a farmstead that used to be a dower house in the 1500s. A dower house um, is a house that a widow of a very rich, um, uh, a well-off man gets as part of her dower. So not the main house, um, but it's a, it's a house for his widow. It's a dower house. And there's lots of antique furniture in there, um, dating from the 1500s, which is, you know, when the dower house is. And uh, it's now a farm. And the minister goes and stays there. He spends the night peacefully in the best bedroom. And the best bedroom is kitted out with all the best furniture, so all the antique stuff. It's all fine. He sits in the chair uh, in the morning to read his Bible. But when he gets up to go and get breakfast, he finds that the back of his hand is bleeding from what looks like a bite mark. So he washes and binds his hand. It's bleeding quite a lot. And the host says, and he goes downstairs, and he says, um, have you got a nail in the chair? Because I think I've done something to my hand. And the host says, well, yes. He says, um, actually, a lot of people who sit in this chair say that they have been scratched. So I think they must be, uh, but on the palm of their hand. Um, so we think that there's a splinter or a nail in the chair. We've looked, we can't see anything. And the minister thinks this is a bit odd because it's the back of his hand that's been injured. Um, but he doesn't think much more about it. So he goes back to bed the next night. And this time he wakes up in great discomfort, feeling a pain in his left side, like the gnawing of a dog. 
Um, so he gets up, uh, tries to strike a light and he finds marks across his ribs, um, just like on the back of his hand, which are bleeding profusely. It takes him a while to staunch the blood, but he manages it and he sits up for the rest of the night reading his Bible. So that's it. In the morning he's off and he goes to fetch his grey mare from the stables and he finds that the mare is also bleeding from bite marks on her neck that look the same as the ones on his hand and side. And he deduces, as you would from this, that the chair is a vampire chair. That is, it contains a vampiric spirit who dislikes men of God. So a group of ministers come along to lay the spirit um, with limited success. Um, so you don't get so many reports of anything happening, but it's still said that if you sit in that chair, you might get scratched. The baby killing bed. This is a tester bed from 1500, uh, so 1580 pictured, not the bed, but an example of what a tester bed is like. And this is uh, part of the furniture in a Cardiff house. And again, best bed, best bedroom. This uh, particular bed in this particular family uh, claimed the life, unfortunately, of the child uh, of the family. So a baby is born um, to the family and is laid in the best bed. And in the morning, unfortunately, the baby has died. And the doctor examines the infant and says that something has sucked its blood from a hole in its neck, like sucking an egg. So a second baby is born to the family and this time they don't put the child in the best bed, very wise. This time, for some reason, the husband decides to sleep in the best bedroom in the four post bed, which is uh, the cause of the trouble. And he experiences a suffocating weight upon him in the night. And the next morning he sees that he has the same mark on his neck. And then he tells his friend and his friend, uh, very understandably, for some reason, wants to stay in the bed himself to see if this is true. Um, and so he does. And it is and also confirms the same experience. And no one uses the Elizabethan bed after that, and they just shut the door and leave it there. Um, because it's the best bed, and you don't just, I mean, you, you can't just get rid of it. So, you know, just shut the door. I'm sure it'd be fine. Um, yeah, so that's your vampiric entities in furniture. Um, so where to now, I suppose? Um, I'm just going to kind of, you've got a lot of... Um, themes and ideas and kind of folklore from this um it's very different now uh, you've got uh, that kind of with devolution in 1997 and the formation of the senate and the devolution of wales um the formation of the welsh government um which has now got devolved powers over education and healthcare um and some income tax raising powers as well now um there's the welsh language act of 1997, which officially promotes um, the Welsh language. Um, sorry, not 1997. Uh, anyway, uh, establishes access to free language courses. There's funding to create more Welsh language medium schools. Um, everything is bilingual with signage and forms, information, and so on. Um, Welsh speakers now make up around 20% of the population. So there's been, you know, a, a, a pickup. Um, it's there's a lot of frustration with the state of Welsh politics. Uh, having said that, there are still areas of serious deprivation and economic decline. Um, and there is still you know, a, an emphasis on family structure and extended family, um, a mentality of not being able to move away from the place of your birth or being stuck in poverty traps um, and that kind of things. Uh, so there's a lot to be Gothicized still in Wales. And you see that, um, in some sort of modern Welsh uh, Gothic uh, TV shows and media and books, uh, things like Hinterland Egoich, um, which is set in Aberystwyth, around, around Aberystwyth, uh, which is kind of Welsh crime noir, I guess, which is a, a, a big uh, kind of subgenre. Uh, Martha Jakashanko is um, set on a declining farm um, in rural Wales. Um, by Carol Lewis. So there's an English version and a Welsh language version. Um, so you have um, films that look at the supernatural and use mythology. The Dark is not great as a film, uh, but it heavily critiques chapel culture, cultish nonconformist enclaves, and the mythology of Anun. Um, so it's interesting in that way. Uh, Sean Bean is in it. Um, you've got Requiem, which is on Netflix at the moment, is a three-parter, came out in 2018. Um, 
rural Gothic without parochialism, which is quite fun, and uses John Dee, uh, who's Anglo-Welsh, um, as a central figure in that. Um, and that uses landscape for claustrophobia and entrapment and creates this uh, to create this atmosphere and deals with um, disinheritance as a major theme. Um, and you have Apostle, the film that came out 2018 as well with, um, what's his name, Michael Sheen. Uh, so you've got the remote island, you've got political distance, dis, uh, political dissent and uh, religious dissent, and the theme of being entrapped by a landscape in, a, uh, you know, uh, not to spoil the film for you, but you know, they're, they're on an island and stuff happens. Um, so you've got um, interesting critiques and things like that going on of, of various uh, kind of parts of, of thought and culture, which is an interesting film. If you look at it through that lens, you don't have to. You can just enjoy it as a film. Um, I've done a chapter by chapter breakdown of Jane Aaron's Welsh Gothic, which came out with the University of Wales Press in 2013 on my blog, which is cmrosens.com. Um, and I've included a lot of, uh, you know, uh, this is basically um, a lot of that is in here. Um, with um, and I just did some added historical context because Arad doesn't go into the context as much um, and uh, that's my bag so I did that for fun and you can read all of that for free. Um, you've got re uh, things like this the Mabinogi series the retellings from Seren books if anyone's interested in those there's a whole set of them now um, some of them are very gothic um, some of them are just fun um, you've got Parthian Books, which is another Welsh publisher. I'm just kind of doing Welsh publishers here to kind of, if you want to have a look at them and support them. Um, things like In and Out of the Goldfish Bowl uh, has a, that, that's got a big, big content warning for um, child sexual abuse, that one. Um, that's set in a council estate in the Ronda, I think. Um, the Cormorant, Martha Jakashanko. Um, Ilolva is another one. Um, lots of Welsh noir crime drama and that kind of thing. Um, and that's about it. So I'm, I have done it again. Da bang on 10 to. Um, so we've got 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much for listening. Um, Sam, if you want to stop recording.